Welcome business leaders and thank you for spending the next hour with us for another online event discussing mental health. For nearly the last two years, the business community has been rallying around the cause of mental health, relying on the guidance of experts and the inspiration from some of our greatest leaders. Today, we are pleased to announce a new resource building off of our past work with the Suicide Prevention Toolkit, Total Safety. This new guide will equip construction businesses with information and tools to make a difference on mental health. I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today's panel, Taylor Smith, with the Associated General Contractors of Utah. Thanks, Nick. My name is Taylor, and I work for the AGC, and I'm very excited to be here today and talk about this important issue, and I'm very grateful to the Chamber for giving us this opportunity to discuss this important issue. Mental health in general, and suicide in particular, are something that has touched most of our lives, either personally or professionally. And in the construction industry, we have serious issues with this. So this discussion today, I hope, is useful and helpful as we try to address these issues. Before we get going, I'd like to let my co-panelists introduce themselves. Terrific. Marissa, why don't you start us off? <laughs> Ladies first, right? Yes. So my name is Marissa Gallegos. I work with Big D Construction as the Benefits Coordinator in Human Resources. I've been with Big D for about six months. I was hired on to create a wellness program for them and also educate our employees on their benefits. It's great to have resources, but if we don't know about them and how to use them, um, they're useless. So I was hired on to educate everybody on how to use them, what they are, and how wonderful they are. Before working with Big D Construction, I worked as a coach and trainer in different positions. So I'm excited to be here to talk about this important topic. Yeah. Very cool. And I'm Dave Broadbent. I'm with Ivory Homes. I'm um, our COO. I've been with the company for nearly 19 years. So I've worn a lot of hats during that time. And so we're talking about two things that are near and dear, uh, both our field teams, as well as HR and the general wellness of, of people. And so I'm, I'm excited to take part in today's dialogue. Thank you both for coming today and we're very excited. So I want to start off with a question, why construction? Why do we have this issue in particular in our industry? One of the statistics that is just mind boggling to me is that for every single fatality that we have on a work site in Utah, we have six construction workers each year pass away from suicide. Why do we struggle in particular in the construction industry? Well, from a wellness standpoint, it's just a horrible cycle that never breaks. So you get on the construction site, we've got our laborers who are dealing with just the stress of deadlines, the stress of working with other subcontractors, working with their managers, just the amount of people that they're dealing with on a personal level. And then also um, just the physical toll it's taking on their body. They get home exhausted every day. They go to speak to their spouse. The spouse has an issue. They don't have the energy to talk about that issue because they're just so tired. Get in a fight with the wife, come back to work thinking about wife. Then you have low quality work on the job site because you're distracted or there's an incident, physical incident that's going on. So then you go home even more stressed. Wife gets mad at you again because you're not you know, paying attention to her. Kids are distracted too. You can't participate with them in anything because you're just, you know, got too many other things on your mind. So it's just this horrible cycle that keeps going and going because of all the stress and physical toll it's taken on your body and on your family. I think Marissa makes a lot of excellent points. You know, it is hard work yeah. and we all benefit from the hard work of these great people who are using their hands and their skills to really build Utah, um, build and even greater beyond in our nation, in our, um, in our world. And as you think about like the stresses of construction, that has only escalated in my mind over the last decade. So we came out of the great recession and all of a sudden there has been more work than anyone can handle. And we, each year we keep thinking, well, okay, we're at our max. But no, we're not. We keep doing a little bit more each subsequent year. And then it comes to, 2020 and COVID hits. And while many people went and worked remotely from home, the people in the field did not. They continued out on the job sites. They were the ones there day in and day out. They didn't, they were there with all the stresses and the fears that all of us had, but they were still out there doing it, trying to distance and other things to keep themselves and their families safe. And they're dealing with all kinds of new stresses. Um, in today's, you know, it, it started in 2020, but then in the 20, 
21 and now, uh, there's not enough people to do all the work to meet the demand um, for construction in the state of Utah. And then add on top of that, all the supply chain challenges and shortages. Uh, this is a group that's working extremely hard in very trying circumstances, and they just keep after it. And sometimes they don't always take the best care of themselves. Right, I think there's this macho mentality often of, well, I'm just gonna get the work done and I don't care about anything else. I'm just gonna get it done because that's all anybody's paying me to do. And so that can bleed over to crews where they tell that to each other and they ignore the issues amongst themselves too. I think sometimes about an apprentice. Um, I worked <clears throat> for our apprenticeship program who worked for a highway company. And during the summer, he was working 60 hours a week out in the middle of nowhere in Utah, staying in a hotel, not seeing his family. And then during the winter, when they shut down the job, he was home alone for three months while his kids are at school and his wife is at work. And so just going from that extreme to the other, again, the hours that we work and the physical and emotional toll that that can cause is incredible. So I think construction, we have tremendous challenges that are unique to construction. Um, but we, I also feel strongly that we have unique opportunities in construction too to address these. Uh, there are very few other industries that have as many safety resources in place, people dedicated towards safety. So what role can safety managers, safety leaders play in helping to promote mental health as well? You hit the nail on the head when you said there's still quite a bit of stigma that's going on, so just start talking about it. A lot of people still just don't have the culture of talking about these issues, and so when they try to implement a pro program, it kind of flops because they haven't started just talking about it. So even before thinking about implementing a program or hiring someone out to come help, just you know start talking about it. Have the guys on the field know their managers, the managers know them, so that when they, something does look off, they recognize it right away and say, hey, I see something's off, can I help you? Is there something going on that we can talk about together? So um, there's some really interesting research on um, the construction industry and the stigma that's going on in a lot of men and women in the construction industry feel um, that they need a sense of worth when they're out on the job site. And then if they don't find that worth, then they're going to go find it somewhere else. But unfortunately, with the stigma, they don't go and search out. They don't typically go and search that out on their own unless someone reaches out to them and says, hey, what's going on? What can I do to help you? And then they'll open up slowly but surely. But just having those resources available once you start having that conversation with them. I think from that conversation comes the trust. And without that trust, they're not, gonna, they're not going to subscribe to whatever that it is that we're trying to provide. And as you talk about it be kind of being you know, rough and gruff at times, I mean, these are strong people, you know, physically, mentally. Um, and you, know, you talk about the safety aspects of it as well. You know, safety, you know, years ago was not a part of culture of many businesses you know, going back through the Industrial Revolution and other times. And slowly that has become a very critical part of what we do. So we talk about protecting our physical safety, but we don't talk as much about our physiological safety. When we talk about our mental and emotional safety, and at the same time, these tough, amazing women and men in these rooms aren't necessarily the group that likes to sit around in a circle and talk about their feelings. <laughs> and so, so there, there are some barriers there. And so I think it really starts with that trust that we generally have, genuinely have their best interest at heart. And what we're trying to do is to help them. So what are some examples of how can we address these? How can we break the ice? How can we actually get people talking? So something that we're doing at Big D that I really enjoyed is we have our safety team and our HR team actually going out to the job sites and talking to people. Unfortunately, you know, I'm in HR. There's a stigma that, you know, we just want to control everybody and, you know, we don't really care about what's going on and we don't see what's going on on the site. We don't understand the real problems that are out there. So I, on a regular basis, two or three times a week, try to get out on the job sites to have conversations with our field workers, have conversations with our superintendents, see our estimators, see what's going on, what they are seeing as the problems, and then actually addressing those issues. At Big D, we also have our, um, in our part of our wellness program, we have a Mindfulness Monday and a Wellness Wednesday. So after I go out to the field and hear the topics that they're worried about, whether it's stress or anger or, you know, 
know, finances, those kind of topics, I address that in our Wellness Wednesday each week. Everybody gets an email, talks about that topic, and then I can get more feedback afterwards saying, hey, that was good. No, I need you to address this next week. And we're able to have that back and forth communication because there isn't a good program unless I'm getting that feedback, seeing what they need and what they want out of a wellness program. So smart to get that and just real time yeah. feedback. And you're not going to know what to do if you're not asking those questions and that they feel comfortable with you. So you have to invest the time to know your people and they need to know that you care. If they know that you care, they will share the things that are hard for them, the things that we can do in leaders in different areas of the organization because they're leaders and their expertise, whether they're managing the job site or subcontractors or different expertise areas and trades, but some of us have been given the opportunity to help them with these other things. But unless they know you truly have their best interest at heart, they're not gonna open up to you about those things. So I think you just need to invest the time. It's the one-on-ones. It's the, hey, I'm thinking about you. Send it a quick text. How are you doing? Or when you see someone who may seem a little bit off, like take the time to just say, hey, are you doing okay? I'm a little concerned about you. You know, worst case scenario, they just ate something bad and they have a bad look on their face. Mm -hmm. You know, best case scenario, there's something that's really bugging them. And you're now a catalyst to hopefully provide some, some help. Absolutely. Do you have any examples of where it's really made a difference on an individual basis or for groups of people? Do you have any examples you'd like to share today? I just keep deferring to you to <laughs> knock it out of the park. Do you want to keep going? Sure. Well, That's yeah, I, the first one that comes to mind is just this last week, I had a leader come up to be saying, hey, there's a guy that I'm concerned about. Can you reach out to him? And um, I was able to reach out to them and yeah, they, they weren't in a good spot. And I was able to use the resources from this total safety booklet to get them in touch with the suicide hotline. And I was able to get them in touch with the Utah Safe app and say, hey, this is how you download it. Talk to someone right away. Promise me that you're gonna call me back after you talk to that person. They committed to me later that day. We were texting over the weekend. We texted a little bit just to check in, make sure he was okay. And then he was back to work on Tuesday. Sometimes those moments come really quick where you just you know, are in a bad place and you just need that person right away to talk to you. And unless that leader hadn't made that, made that um, relationship with that individual and then the leader hadn't made a connection with me, I never would have heard about that and I wouldn't have been able to help and provide the resources that the individual needed. So creating relationships between leaders so they know what the resources are, or if they don't, they know who to talk to like me and then get that person to connect with the person who's struggling. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, I think we've seen so many examples within our business over the last few years as we focus more in this area of people's um, mental health and well-being. And as we were starting to roll out um, a new program, you know, we've used traditional EAPs and just found that it didn't work for most people. But as we sat down and we spoke with individual teams and talked about the many resources that are available, in the community, which are numerous, and then layer that upon some of the things that we chose to do as a business and engage some outside providers. When we talked about these things in such a sincere manner, the floodgates opened. We had meetings that were incredibly touching where people really opened up about hard things that they're facing right now and things that they had buried deep inside. And all of a sudden there was, a, there was an extra level of that safety they felt in being able to share those things. And then for us as a caring business to step in and say, hey, there are resources, there are things to do. And not just pawn them off to some place and say, hey, they'll go help you. But there's people out there who are absolute experts in these areas. And we can't necessarily, what we can do is make sure that we're good at identifying people who have those needs, helping get those resources, and then being a caring, um, uh, I'll call it a accountability person. That's, I see that more with goals, but someone I'd say more of a caring partner 
where you genuinely are doing these things because you care about this person. And I like to think in other specific examples, of course, I don't want to use names or super specific situations, but I have, a, I have an open door policy. And at any time, if someone needs to come talk to me, you know, there's very few exceptions where immediately I don't have them come in and talk regardless of what the topic may be. Because these are the moments when you learn more about what the true needs are. I'm reminded of a story I heard from one of our member companies who was on a large construction site here in the state and they had a fatality. And so they brought in a, uh, a counselor to talk to the crew and to all the friends um, after this person had passed away and they just had a meeting and everyone just kind of sat there with their heads down. And then the counselor said, okay, well, I'm gonna be back here in the trailer doing paperwork all day. Anyone wants to come talk to me? You're welcome. And nobody said anything in the meeting, but then one by one, as they were finishing up with whatever task, somebody would slip away and go talk to them one at a time until almost the whole crew would come in one at a time to talk about what they were feeling, what they were going through, the struggles that they were facing, what this had brought up, losing a friend and a coworker, and all the emotions involved in that. And so again, it's, it's providing that time that is an essential part of this. Piggyback off of both of your comments, you had mentioned goal setting, and I think that's really important in the construction industry. A lot of times when we're talking about mental health, men aren't going to want to go see a counselor right away because they're thinking, I've got to lay on a couch and a shrink is going to talk to me kind of thing. So instead, if we say, let's get you a coach and let's coach you through this, set some goals, some real tangible skills that we want you to develop or that you want to develop yourself, that's the way that we can get them engaged. That's the language we need to use, and that's something that Big D has tried to do. We have new program where we're offering everyone a free wellness coach that's going to offer them those tools that they can talk about any aspect of their wellness because everything ties in together. Um, I imagine with that situation you had, you know, they were concerned about their own families. What if this happens to my own family member? How is this going to affect the job site? How is this going to affect his family's finances? You know, when one thing, when an event happens like that, it affects all aspects of your wellness. And so to be able to coach somebody and create goals with them, that's what's gonna help them move forward and be able to start to open up about their mental health and what things they need to do to get better. For sure, I mean, I, um, you, it's amazing you've only been in this particular <laughs> industry for six months because you have such a great grasp as to what the issues are um, with contractors and others. I, I continue to think a little bit about um, that psychological safety. And part of that too is letting people know that it's okay not to be okay. And when you're not okay, what can you do about it? Because everyone's gonna have bad days. But what can we do to keep bad days from becoming bad weeks? And what do we do from keeping bad weeks becoming bad months? and so on and so forth. And so what is it that, again, coming back to how do we help people feel that safety so that they will turn there? Well, they gotta know you care. They care about your physical well-being. You know, we care about your financial well-being. Of course, that's the paycheck that comes. We care about your financial future. You know, we invest in and retirement plans and other things. We invest in your health insurance so that you can make sure and get taken care of when you have some sort of physical element. But sometimes we really shy away from talking about things that aren't so obvious on the outside, but are very real. I think we've come a long ways as a society to reduce the stigma but to continue to have this as the whole wellness of a person isn't just their physical well-being, but it goes so much deeper. Absolutely. So let's talk about the uh, new guide. Why do you think something like this was necessary and how is it helpful? So at least for me in Big D, I love that it's just one, two, three. Like 
ridiculously easy. Our superintendents, they don't have time to be going through a booklet. If they can have something that just says, do this, 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 boom, it's done. And I love that they have this available resources page where, you know, here's the number. If you've got a person who's got a problem, here it is right here. It's just laid out extremely easy. Um, and then if they have questions, they've got me they can contact. They've got the people here listed in the booklet they can talk to. It's, they've made it literally as easy as they possibly can for someone to access these resources and know what to do step by step. Actual tangible steps that they can do, not just generalized. Now you figure it out on your own. I think it's it's spot on and all I like the uh, the uh, what, what word am I looking for you know, the title but also the uh, um, being able to show what it actually is so one of the things that I think is incredibly helpful about this is I even remember speaking with Nick with Utah community builders and with the Salt Lake Chamber of Commerce as we were looking to increase our focus in this area this was probably two and a half years ago and honestly it was like oh my gosh there's so much here like where do I even start I mean it's a thought of in contractor language like where do you start with a general health and safety plan? <laughs> it's a little overwhelming. So there's a great guide here. Start by trying something. Start by having open dialogues. That was one of the tips that's talked about here with small groups. Get that feedback. Start by doing one or two things within the organization and then take it from there. You don't have to figure it all out right up front to turn it into a success. And in fact, I would discourage you against that. Get started, see what's working, supplement that, tweak things as needed as uh, you see what works for your team members. You know, everyone has a unique culture within their organization. Some things may work better than others, but I, I believe the team has really provided an incredible resource to make those first steps much easier. I agree. Yeah, 100%. So what else can leaders do to implement this program in their companies? I think something really important is sharing stories, sharing their own personal experiences as they feel comfortable. We've talked at length already about the stigma that's out there, but when someone is having a crisis situation and they don't feel comfortable sharing that when they have someone come to them and say, you know what, I've been through that too. You're not crazy. That just brings them down so much just to know that they're not alone, that they're not crazy, that this is something that happens to everybody eventually, especially during COVID. Everybody's lives were turned upside down. It's, it's, become normal that, you know, everyone's having something going on in their life and it's Absolutely. normal. Absolutely. I think you have to be, um, a bit vulnerable. You talk about sharing yeah. some of your personal examples. If that's not the leader of the organization's um, strong suit, I promise there's someone within the organization who has had experience and is someone who's willing to share those things. You just have to break that ice. And I think once that ice has been broken, then you take it from there. And one of the other things, and this is mentioned in in the toolkit as well, is it's an absolute game changer if support comes from the top. So if this is at the CEO, president, owner level, you're off and running, absolutely. Even if it's not at that level, you know, perhaps you're the project manager over a significant project and you have a lot of um, superintendents, a lot of subcontractors and others, you absolutely can be that leader on your job site. Maybe you're um, not in HR, but you're in another area. It doesn't take, it helps immensely if it's coming from the top, but even if it's not coming from the top, start with where you are and do what you can in your sphere of influence to, to do good, to help people feel that safe place and also that um, it's okay. This is a place where we want you to um, be candid, be real. We want to help you because you feel good. We feel good. We're all more productive and more happy. But we also need to do what we can to help provide those tools so that people do know how to bounce back so they have that resilience. 
Absolutely. I, I feel like there's also tremendous strength in encouraging peer-to-peer -peer connection as well. I feel like a lot of men and women in construction, if you hand them resources for them and say, here's something in case you ever need it, they're gonna toss it in the trash. If you hand it to them and say, if your buddy needs this, <laughs> make sure you keep a hold of this. I feel like there's a lot more of a connection there. And if you can, can encourage those already strong bonds that exist between workers and encourage them to be able to help each other in a proactive and productive way, that you can encourage a lot of connection that will produce benefits, will help people to uh, express themselves and overcome these challenges with things sometimes you may not be comfortable going to your boss or your supervisor and you may not be comfortable calling up HR but you can talk to your buddy while you're out working on whatever project you're working on. That's a brilliant idea. I never thought of it that way. And I also, it makes me think there are these sort of conversations happening every day in every, not just in our industry, but in every industry where people have their buddies, their friends or whomever with whom they feel very comfortable and they wanna share. And how much greater is it if the organization makes you feel like that's welcome as well. And there's a place, there's an outlet for them to be supported in that way. Well, provides resources. It's one Absolutely. thing if your friend comes to you and says, I'm Absolutely. struggling, and you say, oh man, that sucks. Yeah, you yeah. wanna go get a beer after? Yeah. Right? <laughs> Instead, you could say, hey, I hear you. Here's somebody you can call. Let's call them together, something like that. Absolutely. Yeah, excellent, excellent point. Yeah, and if we continue to follow what's here in the guide, hopefully um, our leaders, it trickles down to everybody else in the industry. All these trainings that are available, they have a QPR class that talks about suicide prevention and noticing when people are changing and how to have that difficult conversation. Cause it's not, it's not fun to have that conversation with your best friend on the field. Hey, are you considering suicide? Do you not want to be here anymore? That's really hard to say, but if we have that practice and make it part of our culture that what, let's do have those conversations so we can save your friend, then, then we're going that extra mile there. And then they have, you know, mental health first aid that you can take to, to, help improve the communication that's going on within the company. So I just think that's huge peer support. I think another element to think about that I thought about as you were talking about that is some of these things, as much as I hate to admit it, it's for the people who have been in the industry for a long time. Um, because I look at like my kids, I have two teenage daughters. They get this a lot better than I get it. And I've learned a tremendous amount from my kids and their peers and other because they are so much more willing to talk about these sort of issues and they support their friends in these times particular when they're in times of distress when talk of suicide comes in you know depression anxiety the different things that come along they are so much more comfortable having these conversations so i think we can learn from the not only the younger generation, those who are still going through um, school, but newer employees and their experiences are very different. We need to be very welcoming to the thoughts and ideas that they have, because this has been a much more, they've grown up in a more open, shall we call it, time when we've addressed some of these issues, um, you know, straight on. And it's such a tricky balance because we do have those older workers who, you know, grew up in war times. And so they have that harder shell skin. And so how do we have that conversation, having a friendly male alliance so they know, hey, we're here for you. We're not trying to make you more feminine. We're not trying to change you. We just want to give you a skill that's going to be another tool in your tool belt to help you in your mental health journey. Um, and to me, it's not just just what they, they do at work, mm -hmm. but this you know, is with their families, their loved ones, people they care with. These are coping mechanisms. Yeah. These are skills that I think generally make people happier or they know, you know, these are real things. You know, these are a part of the DNA of us, each of us to a certain degree or another, people we love, family members, friends. And so let's be real about it. Absolutely. 
In addressing this, beyond just suicide, what about other mental health issues? You talked about mental health first aid. How do we start to address other mental health issues, addiction, um, other stress issues, things like that? How can we broaden the scope from just beyond suicide prevention? We just have to start normalizing it. Like I said at Big D, we have our Wellness Wednesday. Every Wednesday we talk about a different aspect of our health, whether it's depression or anxiety. Here's a resource. Here's how you talk to your child about it if they come up to you with it. Um, the more we start talking about it, the more normalized it will become. We'll start um, just, yeah, just making a part of normal life. So we just have to talk about it. I know we keep saying that, but that is, it is just that easy. Make a platform, whether it's, you know, your, your intranet, if it's email, if it's a flyer, if it's a poster, just start putting stuff out there. That way they know it's okay to talk about it. It's something normal here. You're not crazy if you are feeling this way. And here's a resource if you do start to feel that way. Uh, excellent points. It's, it's going to be really hard for some people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, e even when you really establish it, it's cultural. Um, you know, I mean, I look at even I've referenced my two teenage daughters. I mean, talking to one about some of these issues. Oh, my goodness. It's so easy. She'll talk. We can talk about everything. The other one, I can't even get her to say hi to me some days. Mm -hmm. And so, y you know, our coworkers and people we care about are, are really no different. But they need to know that if they are in one of those times, that they can trust you and you have their, um, you know, you're going to give them the benefit of the doubt and you have their best interests in mind. Absolutely. And I think part of it goes back to the way we talk about mental health. We often talk about depression, suicide, heavy topics in a way that we don't with physical health. When we talk about physical health, we don't just talk about heart attacks and strokes. We talk about eating right. We talk about exercising and preventative measures and things that you can do right, not just things that can go wrong. And so I think there's an element of that too. We have to talk about resilience and strength and what can you do to build that? What can you do to practice? It's not just an innate quality. You either have it or you don't. You can build these positive mental strengths and identify the ones that you have, the ones that you want. And again, like we were talking about earlier, set goals to get them. Yeah, just a funny story to piggyback off of that. One of our Wellness Wednesdays, I did a box breathing exercise and I had several people comment afterwards saying, oh, I didn't realize I didn't know how to breathe, <laughs> but it's just an easy exercise and tool that they can use when they start to feel anxious, when they start to feel depressed. It's something that people in the military use when they need to get their blood rate down real quick. It's just giving them a practical skill or a practical tool that they can use when you start to feel this way. And how, you know, what is anxiety? What does that look like? How does that look in my body? How does that feel in my body and then what do I do to address that issue just educating everybody on what that is and then how to deal with it I think in the reference I think some of what you've talked about is really the whole self mm -hmm. because when I'm not eating great when I'm not exercising and I'm just go 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 and I don't take time to step back and take care of myself well everything seems to fall apart because all of a sudden, yeah, I think I'm working a lot and I'm putting in a lot of time, but I'm probably not as productive as I would be if I felt better, if I was well rested. Um, and you're just adding more stress when some of these things like exercise and others are excellent stress reducers and things that they do to help balance out ourselves. Um, reading other things that people do to fill the different buckets of their lives, I think all impact or keep things from that stress bucket becoming too full. Right. Well, and you touched on something else that I want to talk about, and that is why is this so important? In addition to just being the right thing to do for your employees, what economic and other benefits might there be for companies for creating and implementing a program like this? We started to touch on it at the beginning, but when your head is not in the job site, then there's more accidents, more physical accidents that cost the company money. There is more rework that has to be done. There is um, defects in quality of the work that people are putting out. So um, even if you've got a leader who's not on board at all with getting on board with mental health and wellness, make that connection with them saying, hey, if things aren't going up going well up here, they're not going to be going well out there on your job site. So in, instead of trying to figure out what's going on here, figure out what's going on here, and that's going to take care of itself. Totally. 
<laughs> so if they, yeah. they, I, I think what, uh, what I take from that is even if a certain manager or leader doesn't necessarily buy into caring about someone's mental health, if they're all of a sudden hearing these people are going to be more productive, they're going to do better quality work. They're like, okay, fine, let's go. Yeah. Why wouldn't they? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. What well, our founder, um, said, and this has nothing to do with mental health, but he'd say, when your mind's gone, take your body with it, you know? And that isn't saying in this situation, we're talking about mental health, meaning if you're in that situation, leave, absolutely not. But as we see the results, if people's minds aren't in it, you're not gonna have a very productive and happy workforce. You're not gonna get a lot done in a productive way. And I think gone is the day where we would say, you know, check yourself out at the door. We're bringing the whole person to work now. And we have to acknowledge that, that a whole person is coming to the job site, not just a field worker. It's a dad who's coming. It's a father. It's a husband. It's, you know, whatever it is, it's a whole person coming on. We've got to take care of that whole person. That way we can take care of the whole job site in a productive way. It comes back to caring. Yeah. You have to genuinely care about those about around you like that and it has to be genuine if they don't feel it they're going to go find that elsewhere yeah absolutely i would <laughs> well, that's the thing is is we have to move beyond just compliance right if the only reason people are harnessing up when they're up high is because the safety manager is walking by and then they don't do it when he's not there you don't have a proper safety program. The same thing goes here for mental health. If they don't know that you care, then they will say, oh yeah, sure, whatever, at a meeting, mm -hmm. raise their hand, take the sticker or the card that you give them and then be fine. But if they don't know that you care, then they're not gonna go any more than just the bare minimum that's mandated of them. For sure. And you know, you made references, there are very specific things you do on Monday and on Wednesday as they relate to wellness. I think it just needs to be a constant part of the dialogue. This is something that we're talking about in meetings that we have as to how people are doing. Um, because if it's not, it like gets a little out of sight, out of mind. I mean, in, in our organization, it's kind of fun. I mean, we joke about it sometimes like, oh man, that was a, that was a really stressful uh, meeting, you know, the hotline's going to be lighting up right after this meeting. And, and, you know, while we make, you know, sort of a light joke about it, in my mind, that doesn't matter because we're continuing to talk about those resources that are available for people when they need them. Yeah. And it isn't difficult to start implementing those conversations in those meetings. Just take five minutes at the beginning or five minutes at the end to address mental health. How are we doing? Check in, do a mindful breathing exercise, whatever it is. Do that in the superintendent meetings. Do that with subcontractor meetings. Do that in your toolbox talks. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to add them in there and it's not going to put a whole lot of work on the guy's shoulders because like you said, there's already so many resources out there. They've got gazillions of toolbox talks already created. You don't have to be creating anything out of your own head. Exactly. And then there's this. Thing and then there's this. Yeah. When it comes to some of those things. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So what else can we say for people who might be um, reluctant or hesitant to try to bring this up to their companies, to their leadership teams? What else can we do to encourage them to adopt a program like this? If you're passionate about it, talk to your manager, talk to HR, talk to whomever you feel comfortable, offer to be a part of the solution. Um, because then it's very genuine, it's very organic. Um, this, in some people, it's more about like what's in it for me. You know, we talked about that project manager maybe who didn't mm -hmm. fully appreciate it. But if you go to uh, individuals in your organization and say, I have an idea how we're going to be more productive and more happy. Can we spend a few minutes talking about it? Um, I, I would be absolutely stunned if they weren't going to provide you with five minutes to hear what you have to say on caring more about the whole self, including mental health. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, Dave. I, there's nothing else I can say. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just that, that, you know, if they're not going to take it from the mental health angle, take it from the production angle, this is going to fix the problems that you're seeing on your job site. 100% of the time. Well, I got that idea from you. Okay, cool. 
<laughs> well, one of the one of the resources in the book that I want to highlight are these stickers that you can mm -hmm. order from the AGC. And we're happy to give them to anybody who wants them. Call me up. The phone number is right there, and so is the email. Um, these stickers are for anybody who's been trained in your company that's willing to wear it on their hard hat, on their vest, on their car, wherever they want to display this. And if they want many of them, again, I'll give you as many as you want. Um, but it's an opportunity to say, hey, I'm here to help. I'm wearing this sticker. Are you okay? Come talk to me if you need to. And this can be anybody. It can be the supervisor. It can be the owner of the company. It can be the newest guy on the team or the oldest veteran on the team. Anybody who's willing to be trained and to be willing to offer those resources. So it's a great opportunity, again, to encourage that peer-to-peer -peer sharing in addition to just going up and down the chain of command. Super cool. Yeah. It's just great a great idea. visual reminder when you're you know, stuck and you're like, who can I talk to? If you see that bright blue sticker, you know. Go talk to that guy right there. Love it. Love it. Well, before we wrap up, do you have anything else you'd like to add today? Just do it. Take that first step. Um, listen, spend some time with your people. Uh, listen to what their concerns are. Listen to what's important to them and start to build a program for there. It, it uh, is an absolute critical investment in our workforce and our people. And the reason I do it is because I genuinely love the people I work with. You know, these are some of my very best friends. These are people that I love to chat with, to socialize with, and also go to battle on, uh, on the job front. So uh, just do it, get after it. Well, something I learned from you today is it's okay to not be okay. And I think that's an important message that we can spread out to everybody. If you're not okay, that's okay. And we can get through this together. It's going to be uncomfortable for a moment, but you're strong. You're resilient. You see the work you're doing every day. You can do it. You can get past this. And then, like I said before, just sharing our stories. It's super impactful when you can say, you know what, I've experienced mental illness or at least a mental challenge in my life. And this is how I overcame it. It just helps people to break the stigma down and feel that it's okay. It's normal. I'm not going crazy. I'm going to make it through it. And I love the title, Total Safety. I think that's an important concept. And part of that comes from the fact that companies and safety leaders in companies will do pretty much anything to make sure that anybody who came onto the job that morning goes home that night. And they've been doing that for years, and that's their whole professional capacity is to get them back home safely. But now it's time for us to also consider what can we do to help them make sure they come back to work again the next morning safely. And so what can we do to fill the rest of that and take care of them as well? And so it's a very important part and a piece that we've sometimes missed in the past, but it's an opportunity we have now to, to close that gap and to care about the whole person. Love it. Yeah. So thank you for coming, everybody. Really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Taylor. We want to thank all of our panelists for their insightful comments. We also want to thank our sponsors of this new resource guide, Big D Construction and Jacobson Construction. We encourage all of you to use this new guide in your businesses and share how it helps make a difference for your employees. Together we can ensure Utah's entire workforce is the most resilient and mentally fit in the nation. Thank you for joining us today.